Well, a very good morning to you, and uh, happy Pentecost Sunday. And we always look forward to Pentecost Sunday as a day where we're reminded of the life and the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit poured out upon the church in those, in those early days, those first days, the birthday of the church and the empowering of the people of God who were turned from fearful to courageous, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit on that first day of Pentecost. So we pray for a great morning together and to be reminded and to be renewed and refreshed that times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. And we need that. Uh, just a few notices, if I may. Uh, the first one is that uh, we've got these forms at the back, and they're also online. If you would like to prefer to fill it in online, uh, you can do that. And this is a, an exercise where we're wanting to listen to the whole church. And there's just some simple questions there that we would love to get your thoughts or feedback on. And so do fill that. They're at the back, at the door as you leave. Feel free to pick one up. And then uh, that will, this kind of listening time, if you can get it back to us by the 13th of June, that would be marvelous. So you can either submit one online or, or use one of these if you prefer. You can, you know, if you, if you don't, if there was not enough space for you or something, then just please put it in an email or a letter or whatever. And you're also welcome to discuss it together in life groups or in other contexts. So please do discuss, share and feedback. Uh, we just want to hear what the, the Lord is saying. And I would ask for us to make that feedback really prayerful as well. It's not just an opportunity to, to just say whatever you think. It's an opportunity to, to pray and ask the Lord what he wants us to be doing as we go forward during this uh, emerging from the pandemic. So <clears throat> hopefully it will all be self-explanatory, but we would love people to engage and, and, and be honest and open and um, to share that feedback. And speaking of going on the website, we, we've actually launched a, a new and updated website this past week, just at the end of the week. So do go on to the church website again and you'll see an update. And we've tried to make it a little bit more outward facing and also to simplify it as well. So hopefully it will be more clear. And also one of the positive things is that you can go on the website and we've got video on the website as well now. So you can, um, you can click there and the video will appear immediately. It's on the front page of the website. Uh, it's like just scroll down a little bit and uh, you'll find that there. Um, so, and also the other new feature we've got is you're also able to give on the website. So you can, uh, if ever you're kind of not able to give in person or whatever, you can go on the website and enter your details and you'll be able to give through the website as well. So there's lots of good advancements happening on that front. Uh, one other thing as well is that you'll soon be getting an email about something called Church Suite, which is uh, a software package that helps us to have a church database where our information is held securely and properly according to GDPR and everything else. And it's a really good way for us to be able to communicate with one another and for the church to be able to communicate with you, to manage rotors, to do all these different things that church life often needs. So Church Suite is a really helpful tool, really. And in the next few weeks, we hope to be able to send you an email about that and how you can log on to that as well. Let's just take a moment to pause and reflect and pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this Pentecost Sunday, we come with humility, we come with expectation, we come with reverence and love. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that this day that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that you'd breathe upon us, Lord, from heaven. Fill us with the Holy Ghost, promise of the Father given, Send to us a Pentecost. Breathe upon us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Spirit.
and today, may we receive that gift fully. And we welcome you into our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to stand and I'm going to lead us in this song. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. This is a hymn, uh, which is also a prayer. O breath of life. So as I sing this, and as you're welcome to hum along or, or speak the words under your breath, um, make it a prayer for your own life and for our life together as a church. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. life come sweeping through us revive your church with life and power O breath of life come cleanse renew us and fit your church to meet this hour O breath of love, come breathe within us, renewing thought and will and heart. Come, love of Christ, afresh to win us, revive your church in every part. O wind of God, come bend us, break us, till humbly we confess our need. Then in your tenderness remake us, revive, restore, for this we plead. Revive us, Lord, is elabating, while harvest fields are vast and wide. Revive us, Lord, the world is waiting. Equip thy church to spread the light. Amen. We remain standing and take our orders of service. Brothers and sisters, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Please be seated. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, 
we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray this Gloria with joy in our hearts. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. We give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. God, who at this time taught the hearts uh, of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We have our Bible readings now. Thank you. First reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, starting at verse 1. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then, how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to, to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading is taken from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 33, on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. 
As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning, burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We remain standing to declare with thanksgiving the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Steve's going to bring the message to us. Thank you, Malcolm. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be together. So as Malcolm said, it's Pentecost Sunday today, 
uh, which is the day that we celebrate really um, what is often called the birthday of the church. And I think in a very real way that passage from Acts chapter 2 really speaks into the moment that we are living in. It was for the church, it was a they had been living, if you like, in a between time. Jesus had appeared to them in his resurrected body, and he had ascended into heaven, and he told them to wait until the Holy Spirit would come. He said, I, I have to go. It is good for me to go, because I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And so they were waiting. They were waiting to see what the future would be like. It was a, in many ways, a point, this was the birthday of the church. And I think in many ways we see in our own time the church perhaps being reborn, rediscovering what it means to be the body of Christ, rediscovering how to be the church in, in this new age, if you like. And that got me thinking, because I, I think actually the disciples probably would have loved to go back to the way things used to be when Jesus was physically present with them. I can imagine they would just would have loved, as we read in the, in the scriptures when Jesus is, is returning to the Father, and they're pleading with him, saying, Jesus, stay, stay with us. I can imagine them in the days that followed thinking, on occasion even, oh, I wish Jesus was still here. He would know what to say. He would know what to do. But as I've already mentioned, in, in John's gospel, John records these words of Jesus just as before his ascension. He says, but truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. For unless I go away, the, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him. Speaking about the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the other people call, uh, use these kinds of names for the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the one who stands beside. Jesus is saying, unless I ascend into heaven, the Holy Spirit will not come to you, and it is for your good that you will receive the Holy Spirit. You see, actually, the disciples might have wanted to go back, but they couldn't. And it was also for their good that they didn't. And we, too, find that we cannot go back. We cannot just go back to the way things were as much as we might find ourselves wanting to sometimes, to, to go back to a time before COVID ever existed, before we knew about what social distancing meant or why we might talk about bubbles or any of those sorts of things. We might want to go back to that time, but we cannot. And I think somehow, actually, it, is, it will be for our good to not go back but instead to follow Jesus, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit, following him into whatever the future holds. Because that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The future is very often uncertain. And yet this one thing we know to be true, he is faithful and he is with us. And he gives his Holy Spirit to all who ask. See, as Malcolm also has already said, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, explains how this small, frightened huddle of disciples, bemused, puzzled, uh, if you like, outclassed, outgunned by society, by the religious leaders of their day, by the empire that still controlled the world that they lived in. It explains how this small group of people 
would go on to form the early church that would rock the foundations of that very empire. They would shake the empire to its core with their conviction in the name of Jesus, in the name that has the power to bring healing and wholeness and hopefulness to all people. So, just briefly this morning, Pentecost is what we call the birthday of the church, but of course it's not originally a Christian day. Pentecost was the day that was already being celebrated, as we read in Acts chapter 2. It was a Jewish agricultural festival. It was 50 days after Passover, which is why it came to be called Pentecost, 50 days It was a thanksgiving for the first fruits of the harvest which were offered up to God, the first wheat sheaf, to say thank you for his provision, thank you for his faithfulness, but also to pray that the rest of that harvest might be safely brought in. Now, Jesus' use of harvest language means that the spiritual allusions for us of that particular picture are already strong. They're already rich for us. But for Jews too, it was the same. There was deep spiritual resonance to the day of Pentecost within their scriptural narrative of God's loving purposes. Because 50 days after the first Passover, Moses received the law at at Mount Sinai. So it was not only this point where they remembered God's provision and gave thanks for his faithfulness and entrusted to him the receipt of the rest of the harvest, but it was also the day they celebrated God's gracious provision of the means by which his redeemed people might live out his purposes in the world. It was the day they celebrated God's gracious provision of the means by which they might live for him. You see, this Pentecost for the early church, this first Pentecost for the disciples of Jesus, parallels both of these aspects, doesn't it? It parallels those first fruits. This was the the first fruits of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on God's people, trusting that many more, and as we know through, as we go through Acts, thousands would come to faith in Jesus Christ. So this first Pentecost, it was like the first fruits, and it was a point where they gave thanks for God's faithfulness that the promised helper, the promised comforter, the promised intercessor and counsellor and strengthener did come. But it was also where they gave thanks for, the, for having been given the means by which to continue to follow Jesus faithfully in the face of adversity. Not with the law that was carved onto stone, but through the Holy Spirit, it was imprinted upon their hearts. Something that the prophets of the, in the Old Testament had spoken of hundreds of years before. That God would take our hearts of stone and by his power would melt them. That he would write his law upon our heart. That we would no longer need to teach, say to one another, keep the law of the Lord. But that we would know it. But of course the important thing about Pentecost is this, it isn't just theoretical. It's not just an abstract or symbolic day. Symbolism has to be real to have any meaning. You know, it's all very well learning how to drive, for example, but it's, it's fairly pointless if we never dare to set foot out of our door and actually drive. This Pentecost is not primarily intended to be understood so much as to be experienced. It's not primarily intended to be understood so much as 
experienced. And the, the purpose of Pentecost, the purpose of the, the Holy Spirit, this wind that's described as coming from heaven, the breath of God, is not, so, not to make us, if you like, so heavenly-minded that we're no earthly good. I forget who first coined that phrase, but I like it. It is not, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not that. It's not to make us so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit is that the whole earth and how we think of it and relate to it and engage with it and care for it and steward it, that all of it is transformed by the power of heaven. It is God's will done on earth as it is already in heaven. It is the coming together of those two worlds where the full sovereignty of God is known and worshipped and glorified. Coming and meeting, touching earth, bringing the, the power and the strength to live out according to his purposes, to renew the face of the earth. And it has to start with us with our thinking, our doing, our speaking. If you like, with our, our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. It has to start with us. With us, the followers of Jesus, being renewed in his strength. Because actually again and again in the work of the church and in the church's life, there have been plenty who have loved to proclaim from afar that we are wasting our time. That we're wasting our time with this first century Galilean Jew, this carpenter who died on a cross. We say that the church is, is only interested in itself has no future, is losing its connection with the current generation, is doomed to die. There have been many who have loved to say that we are wasting our time following this Jesus, talking incomprehensible nonsense. But I think, equally, there have been Periods in our, in our history, and I know in my own life too, where I have been equally so concerned to keep up a safe and respectable appearance, to ensure that I look perfectly ordinary and normal, that I would never, under any circumstances, be accused of being drunk at any time of the day, let alone 9 a.m., the challenge that comes to us through the centuries is are we living in our obedience to Jesus with enough, if you like, energy or spirit-driven life, with enough conviction, with enough faith to make someone who is looking on pass any comments at all about what's going on. The question I keep, have to keep coming back to, and I find it a very challenging one, if I'm honest, is am I willing to be misunderstood by the world because I want to be faithful to Jesus? Am I willing to be misunderstood to have some people say, well, that's Steve. He's just, his head's off in the clouds. He doesn't, he's not really, he doesn't know what real life is like. He's just, he's being a relentless optimist. He'll, he'll come crashing down to earth soon. Or, yeah, I don't know what's gotten into him. He doesn't seem to be able to take life seriously or, or, or whatever it is. Am I willing to be misunderstood out of obedience 
to Jesus. You see, the point isn't about acting weird. Please don't hear me say that. The point is not about acting weird so that people will walk around in your day-to-day life and say, are they drunk? That wasn't really what Luke was getting at. You see, when we talk about Pentecost, I think sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk about Pentecost, we're sometimes tempted to equate it with perhaps some of the more, um, if you like, free or, or extreme understandings of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is not the same as, if you like, Pentecostalism, for example. I'm not primarily here talking about holy rollers or anything like that, whatever the picture is for you. You see, through Scripture, God's presence, his Holy Spirit is described like wind, and the word also means breath, the breath of God. You see, for us, being filled with the Holy Spirit is intended to be as natural as breathing. God breathed life into us in creation. Jesus When we read the account in John chapter 20, Jesus breathes on his disciples to receive the Holy Spirit. Each one of us needs to physically breathe to live, but we also need to spiritually breathe in the Holy Spirit to really come alive. It's not so much that we act weirdly or irrationally or bizarrely or or we act out because we're full of the Holy Spirit but it's that full of the Holy Spirit in obedience to Jesus we follow him in his way which seems like utter nonsense to the world and so they look at us and they think well they seem to be going against the flow everything about life seems to suggest that we should go this way but they seem to have the strength and the conviction and the trust to go that way. And there seems to be life in it. What's that about? You see, Acts chapter 2, the passage that Phil read for us, in one sense, it is actually entirely natural. They were speaking earthly languages. Yes, they were languages that they didn't previously know, but they were speaking a language that was understood by people on the street. This wasn't, they weren't being accused of being drunk because they were stumbling around and they couldn't find their balance. It was just something that the world couldn't understand. It was God empowering his people to do something different. So in one sense it was natural, but it was also extraordinary and seemed inexplicable to the world around them. And I think that is the call upon us as a church, as we look ahead into the unknown, into the uncertain future. What will life be like? We're called to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and follow Jesus, to follow him into whatever the future holds, knowing that he's faithful and that he is with us. So I'd just like to close with a prayer, if that's all right. This is an opportunity for each one of us. Maybe, maybe you've never consciously received the Holy Spirit before maybe actually for all of us it's a chance to just be to be refreshed to be refilled to be renewed to be recommissioned as we prepare for what is to come so let's pray overflowing God of abundant goodness Breathe your Holy Spirit into us. And we pray especially for those we know who have drifted from your way, gotten stuck 
in their faith or who have not yet found a way to believe. Renew us. Renew your people in your Holy Spirit. And today, may your church be filled with joy. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue to pray, be led by Roger, who's going to come and lead us in prayers. Thank you. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Steve has already reminded us that Pentecost is from the Greek, indicating the 50th day, originally after the beginning of the harvest, Middle Eastern climate, of course, um, but also 50 days after the, the Passover and after the rising of Christ, our Christian Easter, to a new but different life, power for a new season. Thus we celebrate and commemorate the events of that day when the apostles, Christ's closest followers, heard a noise like winds and saw flames as of fire, the coming of the Holy Spirit, whatever exactly were these phenomena. We pray for ourselves that we may understand and be inspired by these events. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, these words may recall the Grenfell Tower fire, which occurred four years ago in June, and the public inquiry into those events taking place at present. <laughs> We find a place in our hearts for those who died, those who survived the terror, and those still living in accommodation with dangerous cladding or threatened with unmeetable bills. We pray that our society will be prepared to deal with these matters in a fair manner. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our prayer diary for today calls on us to pray for a peaceful resolution to the conflict between, between Israel and Palestinians in what we often call the Holy Land. We thank you for the understanding and love in the hearts of humankind which you place there and for the work of those who seek to redress wrongs and create just societies but we are only too aware of our fallibility and failure to understand the needs and desires of others, as we said earlier, to love our neighbours as ourselves. So we give thanks for the truce agreed a couple of days ago between representatives of these two peoples aspiring to live in the same land, but praying that people may come forward who seek reconciliation to go further than a mere truce and have the ability to lead their peoples to a permanent solution to this conflict. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the dedication and application of knowledge and skill and the hard work of medical staff in fighting coronavirus. We give thanks for the success in finding and administering vaccinations, but pray also that the wealthier parts of the world will give more assistance to the poorer countries to achieve similar success in checking the spread of this virus. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you, Roger. May we stand together. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's just turn to greet one another with the sign of God's peace. Just take a moment of quiet as we come into the Lord's presence to receive this communion today. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. And when we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children, and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is broken for all. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. And as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you the sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And as our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So, brothers and sisters, draw near with faith, Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. And so we welcome all who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ to this communion today. And we're going to be conducting it as we do at the moment in a COVID-safe way. Uh, and uh, if you would like to receive, just please keep your hands out. Um, if you prefer just for a blessing, then just put your hands perhaps up to your heart, your chest. And if you prefer for any number of reasons not to receive, which is fine, then just keep your hands by your side and we will know to pass by. But uh, may the Lord bless us today as we come to this communion, that we may know his love and his goodness and his mercy in our lives. Amen.
join together in prayer, the prayer after communion. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just before the blessing, I think it would be really wonderful having heard the message today and uh, just as it's Pentecost Sunday, perhaps just to spend a few moments um, in prayer. You may want to just keep your hands in front of you and that's fine. It's like we're receiving a gift. And just allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and minister to you and sense his presence and his nearness. And in this time, you may just want to pray a simple prayer a few times to your, into your own, in your own heart. You may just want to pray, come Holy Spirit. Inviting the Holy Spirit to fill you, to bless you, to keep you, to protect you and comfort you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. <laughs>